Thank you, Joe. Thank you for uh, turning out uh, today. I am sure uh, since, since Joe went over time, he'll be more than happy for me to go over time as well. I'm actually very fortunate that I followed Brooke Rollins uh, at lunch. Brooke said some stuff that was very profound because I'm not an economist, you know, as Joe described. I did a lot of economics as an undergraduate, but I'm not an economist. I'm a philosopher by training, a moral philosopher. And my first mentor, the first person I worked with, was a guy named John Bodden. And he was an economist, but he always talked about ethics and having the moral high ground. One of the things he taught me a long time ago, this is a saying that he had, people don't care what you know until they know you care. So I'm here to tell you I care, and what I care about is your freedom, your liberty, your freedom to choose the vehicle of your choice depending upon what your desires for that vehicle are. If you care about fuel economy, I'm happy for you to get the highest fuel economy car, and if you care about comfort and the ability to haul a boat to the lake, I'm happy for you to be able to do that too. I don't want to restrict your choice, and I don't think government should be in the business of deciding for you what should be most important characteristic of the vehicle you drive. And that's what CAFE standards did. Automobility is a form of freedom. There we go. Good old days of freedom. I'm going to take you on a little bucolic history tour here. Uh, we, had a, we had a station wagon like that. Um, we didn't have a boat, unfortunately. But my grandfather always did. So automobility is a form of freedom. My friends and colleagues at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, where Sam is, where I was for a very short period of time as an intern, they believed what I believe were the first studies on the CAFE standard. One was by Fred Smith in 1990. And again, from Lauren Lemaski, uh, a philosophy professor who was on my master's committee uh, at Bowling Green State University back in 1995. Now, Lauren described a number of ways automobility increases freedom. It directly complements autonomy, he said, the distinctively human capacity for self-direction. It enabled us to extend the scope and influence of our uh, influence in the world, where we will work. It makes us, it helps us make, decide things like that. Where we will work, where we will vacation, a, a concept that a hundred years ago was beyond the reach of all but uh, the millionaires, like the, the idea of taking a week or two or a month off to go somewhere for pleasure from work, who could afford that? But with relative wealth came the ability to do that and cars enhanced that. Uh, we could make choices about how close we suddenly didn't want to be to our family or not. Um, automobilities enhance privacy, he says. Public transport's not bad. I, I've taken the train. I, I enjoy the train. Uh, we all fly. I've taken buses. Uh, but not as the only vice. Sometimes it's not a viable alternative. And quite frankly, I don't want to always sit next to strangers when I'm going someplace. Maybe I want to listen to a particular kind of music or a news program that they don't want to hear, and I don't want plugs in my ears. You know, uh, when I used to commute to work before I just rolled out of bed in the morning and went and turned on my computer working for Heartland, I liked my time in the car because it was my time. I wasn't dominated by work. I was learning things that I wouldn't have had time to learn otherwise. Automobiles allow control over one's immediate environment. Well, people are, are fond of their cars in part because it allows them to do all sorts of things when they want to do it. I want to go to a movie, hop in the car and go. Want to go grocery shopping this time? Do it. It get, allows you the freedom to live outside inner cities. 150 years ago, you were a farmer or you lived in these big brownstones and other houses like that in the inner cities, like Chicago and Washington, D.C. and uh, St. Louis, along rivers, which, excuse me, Long rivers, which were the transit ways for uh, progress back then. Freedom to visit distant relatives whenever you want. You don't have to get on a train and go hundreds of miles. I can, I can, go to, I can live 40 miles from my grandmother and still visit her weekly if I want to, as opposed to taking two or three days in, on the horse to get to my grandmother's place. Uh, so it, it allows freedom in a 
a lot of ways. And it, it allows, oh, well, I don't know what happened there, the ability to go camping, haul the boat, all those things that, uh, that we love. The good old days of, this is a station wagon, right? The, the Ford station wagon. When's the last time you saw something like that on the road? I'll, t I'll tell you when. It was shortly after 1978, 79, when the first fuel economy standards went in place, and they, they became extinct. We now have station wagons again, but they're a little bit different. That, anyone, can anyone name that car? Chrysler. It's a Chrysler. A 1966 Chrysler Newport. I was three years old when we got that car, and I remember when they brought it home, they were so excited. That car served us for over 10 years. Uh, we called it Limp Limpic Lena. It no longer exists. They stopped making them shortly it's after. rusted and fell apart after. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, ours, ours was still going strong when we uh, stopped it using it. So, um, a Texas special. I'm from Texas. You got your uh, Cadillac Eldorado with the long horns. Like I said, the good old days. But we also had choice. That was the first really, really small car I ever remember seeing. It's a Honda Civic from the 70s, late 60s, early 70s. They were on the roads. I thought they looked like roller skates myself. And the first small American car. Now, when I say small car, I'm not talking about the English convertibles like the Triumph TR6 or the Spitfire, but uh, the Ford Pinto. So we had choice even back then. They had smaller options. But then along came in 1973 the Arab oil embargo. Arab oil embargo, uh, uh, Arab countries embargoed not just the United States, but a number of countries around the world over um, the Yom Kippur. Kippur War. They thought we were taking Israel's side. In response, in 1975, that was 1973, Congress passed the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. It was U.S. Congress's response to the Arab oil embargo, which was over by then, by the way. The embargo was done. But three years later, we, uh, we passed a law to fix the problem that no longer exists. And it was loaded with bad ideas. Conservation program for consumer products, which Sam asked a question about earlier today. Corporate average fuel economy standards was the worst, though. Uh, they mandated uh, fuel economy by 1987. By 1985, the average fuel economy was supposed to be 27.5 miles per gallon. Uh, under CAFE, there was a difference. Trucks and cars were treated differently. And not every vehicle had to meet the standard. It was across your fleet of vehicles. So you could still make the large cars, so long as you made small cars, and sold small cars. You have to sell them. People have to want to buy them. If you're not selling cars, you're in trouble. So what was the standard? What was the penalty? You paid $5.50 per 0 0.1 miles per gallon, multiplied by the manufacturer's total production for the U.S. domestic market uh, if your fleet didn't meet the CAFE standards. So it could be pretty steep if you sold few million cars a year. Now there was an additional gas guzzler tax, uh, this came later, for cars that got less than 22.5 miles per gallon when the standard was 27.5. So uh, the, you know, your Ferraris, your, uh, your Lamborghinis, your exotic cars that came into the country, they had to pay the gas guzzler tax. Now within a decade of CAFE standards being imposed, the size of the fleet had declined dramatically on average, and the amount of metal and steel had declined. I won't talk about the safety provisions. Sam's going to talk to you about that, but that's something I usually like to talk about. But the full-size station wagon went virtually extinct. Right, so it's going backwards, sorry. What's the difference between these two vehicles right here? Can anyone tell me? It's a Ford Ranchero, it's a Ford F-150. That's correct. The Ford Ranchero was on a car chassis, had to meet the CAFE standards, the, the higher CAFE standards. The Ford F-150 wasn't even created until after CAFE. Ford had trucks, but they didn't have the F-150. 
The F-150 came in after CAFE. What do you see on the road today? The other big difference, the Ford F-150 is there. You don't see the Ranchero anymore. It disappeared after CAFE. Here's another one. There's a good old Mercury Marquis, and that's the Jeep Wagoneer. Well, you don't see Wagoneers anymore, but you see other things that look similar, Cadillac Escalades, uh, your, your big Toyota Land Cruisers, things like that. Um, they serve the same purpose before CAFE. Actually, the Wagoneer was around before CAFE, but that one went away because it was on a car platform, and this one survived because it was on a truck platform. And not just survived, but thrived because people voted with their dollars. They said, if we can't have a station wagon and we still want to haul a boat, haul the kids to the soccer game or baseball game, I prefer baseball, uh, pick up groceries, do camping, whatever, that satisfies the need and the smaller cars that you forced on the road didn't. Now, uh, let me go back. So the rise of the SUV, the minivan, I didn't, don't have a picture of a minivan, I could have gotten one. It didn't even exist before cafe standards. It wasn't that, there were some of these SUVs, but the minivan didn't exist. It was a creation of the cafe standard for the soccer mom who didn't want to drive the big hulking Wagoneer. She still wanted something uh, 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 more like a car and less like a utility vehicle. Now, the first utility vehicles, 1960 Jeep Harvester. They were, there were a few vehicles coming out of World War II, usually military surplus, but the 1960 Jeep Harvester. Harvester Scout, neat vehicle. You could actually take the roof off with a ratchet if you, if you want to uh, uh, ride around as a convertible top. You had the Ford Bronco in 1966, the Jeep Wagoneer, the first luxury SUV, picture of. 1962, the Chevy Blazer, 1969, the virtues of SUVs, they sat higher than sedans or fading station wagons, and they didn't have to meet the higher cafe standards. And then the minivans arose. Dodge Chrysler, 1980s, shortly after cafe came into existence and was starting to be enforced for the first time. It started in 75, didn't start being enforced until 78, and then you had the minivan. Uh, the virtues, well, of course, they haul more people. They can haul boats. They can do all sorts of things that smaller cars can't do. Now, truck sales. You can't go around Texas, but probably uh, Louisiana and most states as well, without seeing trucks. When I was a young kid, you didn't see trucks except on ranch roads or my grandfather's house because he had boats and liked to go fishing all the time. Uh, the best-selling vehicle in this country, not truck. They always advertise, oh, the best-selling truck in the country for the 35 years, Ford F-150. Best-selling vehicle in the country for 25 years, Ford F-150. More than cars. Last year, not 2017, it sold more than double the number of the first non-SUV sedan in the top 10 which came in at number six, by the way. The top three, Ford F-150, Chevy Blazer, I mean, uh, Chevy, uh, the Chevy, comparable Chevy, Silverado. Chevy Silverado, and the Dodge Ram. Next two were SUVs, then you get a Toyota. First car, sixth on the list. Six of the 10 SUVs or trucks. People vote with their pocketbook. Um, now, all these changes were primarily in response to uh, CAFE standards. It did not, contrary to uh, government, I don't know what's going on there. I push the same button and get different response. It did not reduce uh, the amount of imported oil, which was what the original intention was supposed to be. Uh, we went into a recession and the amount of oil and gas sold uh, dropped, but it went right back up, even with high gas prices. Uh, it, it wasn't until fracking revolution that we really started to reduce the amount of foreign oil. So, real quickly, in the last decade, I've already told you what the, the facts are about the Ford F-150. 
In 2017, F-450 were more than double the sales of the first sedan. As far as I can determine, no electric, hybrid, or gasoline-powered subcompact has ever made the top 10 in sales in the U.S. I've been able to go back year for year, at least through 2009. That includes when gasoline was selling at, what, 150 a barrel? I mean, oil was, and gasoline was over $3 a gallon. Um, in no year have any of those three trucks been out of the top 10 in sales, not in a single year. Uh, even with tax credits, even with subsidies, and even with high oil prices, none of the small cars can crack the top 10. For those with a concern about buying a vehicle, fuel efficiency, they have choice. They have, uh, there are 13 cars that get more than 60 miles per gallon at present, with eight electric vehicles topping the equivalent of more than 100 miles per gallon. Though they have fairly limited ranges, so don't decide to take a trip from Dallas to Houston in one without planning a stopover to recharge. None of these vehicles is a stop seller, not even breaking the top 20 in sales. Between 25 and 40 miles get more than 40 miles per gallon. More than five miles above the current MPG uh, cafe requirements. Consumers have choice. If you want, if uh, uh, fuel efficient car, you've got that choice. All I ask is that the rest of us who don't think fuel efficiency is the most important factor when they go out to buy a vehicle get to keep our choice at well and the government shouldn't be deciding that for us. It's about freedom, folks. For me, that's what it's really about.